the book of Ephesians and the third, the third uh, chapter, beginning with verse 4. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14. I'm sorry, I said 4, 14. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. That's the phrase we're going to use this morning. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Verse 19, the B part, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Coming to know the Lord is one of the greatest experiences or is the greatest experience that any of us will ever experience. It's a joy that comes that is unspeakable and full of glory. To know that we're saved and to know that Christ lives in us, and our sins are forgiven and we're going to heaven. But there's much more than the initial experience. Salvation is more than just a, a a fire escape or safeguard from hell. If that's all it was, that would be enough because I certainly do not want to go to hell. And I'm grateful that God has made a way, the way, to keep us from going to hell. Salvation is more than looking forward to heaven. And certainly we're to look forward to heaven because heaven is our eternal home. This is just a very short time here. Just a speck in eternity. If it even marks in eternity, it'd be very small mark. Very short time. And then we go to our eternal home. But the Christian life is uh, more than looking forward to heaven. It's more than a fire escape from hell. The Christian life is, is not just pain, sorrow, and suffering. These experiences will come, but during these experiences, we can have the joy and the peace. One of my favorite chapters in the book of Acts is Acts chapter 5, where the apostles were arrested for preaching the gospel, and they were placed in the common prison. And there an angel was sent to them and released them from that prison. And they went back out into the temple area, which was the common area uh, about the center of the town. And there they were preaching. They were preaching again the gospel. And so some saw them doing that. And they went to the authorities and said, you know, those people that you put in jail, they're out. They're preaching the gospel out there just like they were. So they went down to the jail. And here's the amazing thing. They went to the jail and they found the keepers of each one of the cells, each one of the blocks, standing in their place, just where they were supposed to be. And they opened the door and no prisoners in there. You see, God sent an angel and released them and they started preaching again. Well, they went out and arrested them again. And they took them in before the authorities and they were just about ready to stone them, to put them to death. And Gamaliel stood up and uh, spoke for them. 
pleaded their case and said, if this is not of God, it will fade away. But if it is of God, then you don't want to hinder it. So they lashed them, they whipped them, and they let them go. And they said, don't you say a word about this gospel. You have spread the gospel. You have spread this word all over Jerusalem. But you leave here. Don't you say a word about the gospel. Just keep your mouth closed. So they released them. But you'll read there that they left rejoicing. It was a time of difficulty for them, no doubt. But they left rejoicing, counting it a blessing to be able to suffer for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is with us during all the difficult times that we experience. Only when we understand the fullness of Christ can we enjoy being a Christian right now. Christianity, again, is more than just looking toward heaven. We're to enjoy being saved right now here on this earth. And my remarks this morning and this message will center around four aspects of Christ that will reveal to us his fullness. And the first one is Christ for us. Galatians chapter 3 and 13, Paul writing to that church, he said, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. And of course he is talking about the gospel, about the crucifixion of Christ. Jesus took our place on the cross. The substitutionary work of Jesus is fundamental to the view of Christ. This is where everything else is uh, in the Christian life rests. You can't expect to see Christ in any other view until, first of all, you see him for you on the cross. Now, the Bible is filled with this. And, you know, I enjoy reading uh, the passages that, that Simon Peter writes in relation to the crucifixion. He writes about it uh, uh, two or three times in the letters uh, that he wrote. In chapter 3 of 1 Peter, in verse 18, uh, Simon Peter said, For Christ also hath suffered, once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened, or that is, made alive in the spirit. He's talking about the crucifixion of our Lord. Jesus Christ suffered for us. He suffered in three ways. First of all, he suffered physically. And we need to understand that the physical suffering of Jesus was very real and it was very painful. It was excruciating. It all started in the Garden of Gethsemane. I was reading last night uh, the, all the accounts in the Gospels about Jesus going into the Garden. He told the apostles to stand here and stay here and wait. So he went into the Garden and he began to pray. He prayed, Lord, if this cup pass from me, now the cup, what's he talking about? What's that cup? That cup is not the physical suffering that Jesus endured on the cross. He was not repelling from that. The cup is the judgment of God that was going to be poured out on him on the cross. The judgment for your sins and the judgment for my sins. And he recalled against that, Lord, if this cup pass from me. And the Bible tells us he prayed three times. And, and one of the gospel writers, I believe it's a gospel Gospel of Luke, maybe. Uh, he said that when he prayed, he sweat as it were great drops of blood. I believe that literally he sweat drops of blood, that the blood vessels inside his uh, sweat glands erupted and he sweat blood. And after that agonizing time of prayer, his whole garments were covered and stained with blood. He began to shed his blood for you and for me right there in the garden. And after he had finished praying, he prayed that God would, would remove the cup if it be his will, but it wasn't God's will to do that. So he was content with that. He said, thy will be done. He was taken to Pilate's court and they scourged him. They lashed him 39 times with the scourger's whip. Now the scourger's whip is something like our bull whip. Only difference is that the scourger's whip had pieces of
of metal and pieces of rock and, and various pieces of uh, sharp objects that were interwoven in that uh, whip and they could literally cut a man's body in two if they so desired. These scourgers were not amateurs. They were professionals and they lashed the back of the Lord 39 times and every time they lashed his back it was for you and for me. He shed his blood on that cross. They scourged him and they uh, falsely accused him and then they tried him in the Jewish court and then they tried him again in the, in the Roman court. They tried him twice in the Roman court and then they took him to the place of the skull which is called Golgotha and on the way they uh, wanted him to carry that cross which uh, approximately 150 pounds well, after the beating that he'd already received and his weakness in his body he fell beneath the load of that cross and another person was chosen to take the cross on to Calvary and they got to Calvary they laid him on the cross and they stretched his arms out like this and they drove spikes through this part of his hand through his wrist to, so that he would hang on that cross and they crossed his feet like this and drove spikes through his feet and through his legs uh, to hold him to that cross and they disjointed all the bones in his body. That's the physical suffering that Jesus experienced on the cross. He received a crown of thorns upon him on his head. They, they weaved, they made a special crown for him to be placed on his head so that he would suffer even more. And they gave him vinegar to drink and it parched with his parched mouth and his parched lips. It, uh, it stung and hurt him. That's the physical pain. But listen, there's more to the suffering of Christ. Not only did he suffer physical pain, but he suffered emotional suffering. They mocked him in, in Matthew chapter 27. This account says uh, that they said to him, if he be the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross and we will believe him. They mocked him and they shamed him. They stripped him and slapped him and grabbed and gambled for his garments and they made sport of him. They wagged their heads at him and said, save thyself and come down from the cross. They made fun of him. They talked about him, not to him, but they talked about him and they ridiculed him. Emotionally he suffered, but listen, he suffered spiritually. This is the worst suffering of all. Worse than the physical suffering. Worse than the emotional suffering is the divine spiritual suffering. First of all, there's the divine wounding. Who killed Jesus on the cross? Who put him to death? Did the Romans put him to death? Did the Jews put him to death? Did the soldiers put him to death? Did the crowds that reviled him and made fun of him, did they put him to death? Not any more than we did. I'll tell you who put the Lord Jesus to death on that cross. God the Father put him to death because God the Father planned every bit of it before the foundation of the world. He said that, that Jesus was crucified in the heart and mind of God before the foundation of the world. He planned it. You see, he's the one responsible for it. He planned it and he put him to death. The divine wounding in Isaiah 53 and 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And then there's the divine withdrawal. Out of the darkness, Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus hanging on that cross. God the Father turned his back on him. He'd not experienced that before, but God the Father turned his back. And, uh, and Jesus hung there. And he said, Why have you forsaken me? And the Bible tells us why Jesus was forsaken by God the Father over in a back of chapter 1 and verse 13 the scripture says that God is so pure and holy that he cannot look upon sin and when Jesus Christ on that cross was receiving the wrath and the judgment of God that he re that he recalled against in the garden that, that judgment of God was falling upon the Lord Jesus Christ he was taking upon himself the sins of the whole world and the Bible tells us God 
God the Father is so pure and holy that he cannot look upon sin. And when the Savior was taking your sins, you think about the sins that you've committed this week. You think about the things that you've done that you wouldn't want anybody to know. The thoughts that you've had that you wouldn't want anybody to know. You think about those sins. Our Savior on the cross took those sins upon himself on that cross and died for us. The judgment, the wrath of God against sin was poured out on him. Jesus endured being abandoned by God the Father in order that the wrath of God might be poured out on him. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity, the sins of us all. Jesus Christ suffered physically. He suffered emotionally. He suffered spiritually. The basic truth of the gospel is that Christ was for us on that cross. But then there's the next step. Christ in us. If we're going to know the fullness of God, the fullness of Christ, we not only must see Christ for us, but we've got to see Christ in us. Galatians 2 and 20 says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I, I live, but it's Christ that liveth in me. It's not, it's not just enough to, to see Jesus for us. Uh, the devil saw him and believed, but it was just an a intellectual belief. It's not enough to just see him for us. You must accept him as your Savior in order to have him in your heart. You must come in repentance and faith and, and come to Christ and say, I'm a poor sinner. I can't save myself. There's no way. I have no, no uh, means of, of redeeming myself. Lord, I'm helpless. I'm hopeless. I trust, I'm trusting you. And when you come that way, then the Lord will save you and you'll be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that we receive the Spirit when we believe. Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Ephesians 4, 6 says, one and one and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Seeing Christ in us is much greater view than just seeing him for us. We must see him for us and accept him, but we must also see him in us. Someone wrote, all of God was in Christ. All of Christ was in me. All I needed is Christ himself, and I have him living inside of me. Now, the scripture clearly teaches that Christ indwells the believer. One of my favorite ver verses in relation to this is 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4 where it says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The world is filled with demons and, and Satan's control, but greater is he that is in you. Who's in us? The Holy Spirit is in us. God, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit lives within us. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote, but Christ is all and in all. Paul again wrote, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. And in speaking of the Spirit, who was to be another comforter, two words for another, or that is, two, word, yeah, two words for another, in the Greek language, one means another of the same kind, one means another of a different kind. And here we have the word translated another that means another of the same kind. Jesus said in talking about another comforter, another one just like me, Jesus promised that he shall be in you. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit of God came to live in the hearts and lives of believers permanently. That's the first time in the Old Testament the Holy Spirit came upon people and, uh, and hovered over people and indwelt people for a while and, and led people and guided people in the Old Testament days. Uh, you look at the work of God, it's always guided by the Holy Spirit, but on the day of Pentecost was the first day, the first time that the Holy Spirit of God came to live within the believer's heart permanently. You see, when you came to know Christ as your Savior, the 
the Holy Spirit of God came to make his abode in your heart. He will never leave you. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. He's the earnest of your expectation. God is giving you the Holy Spirit to tell you that one day I'm going to give you glory. One day I'm going to give you heaven. One day you'll be a finished transaction. One day the deal will be over. He puts down the earnest promise. The Holy Spirit, if I'm a Christian having invited Christ to live in my heart, I can say Jesus Christ is alive in my life right now. I may not feel like it. I may not be worthy of it. I may not understand it. I may not feel it all the time. But the truth is that all the time, every night, every day, at work and play, when I feel up and when I feel down, Jesus Christ is alive in me. Amen. He lives within our hearts. Now, what does all this mean? What does all of this mean? In very practical terms, what does that mean? The Holy Spirit living in and through us. Well, let me suggest some things that it means to me. And I believe it will mean that to you. When I'm sick, he's with me to remind me that he is the great physician. And when I'm weak, he reminds me that he is the one that strengthens me. And when, I've, when I'm discouraged, he's the one that encourages my heart. And when I'm tempted, he's the one that gives me strength and power over the temptation that comes our way every day. When I'm rejected, Christ is with me to remind me of his acceptance. And when I'm going through financial problems, Jesus is there in my heart to remind me that he is my source. And when I'm raising my family, Jesus is with me to remind me to teach them the principles of God and to teach them the word of God. When I'm working in my vocation, Jesus is with me in order to help me in making the right decisions and when I'm going through marital problems, Jesus is with me to remind me that he is the great lover and that he will love through me. And when I walk through the valley and the shadow of death, Jesus is with me to remind me that he is sufficient when no man is sufficient to comfort and assure. That's what it means in a practical way. The Holy Spirit living in our hearts in a difficult time in the sorrow, in the heartaches, in the heartbreaks, in the bad news, and the good news, whatever comes our way that means in a practical sense that the Holy Spirit of the Lord is with us to comfort us when the words and the deeds of man will not suffice the Holy Spirit will. One of the greatest truths of Scripture is that Christ lives in us. The human mind cannot fathom this great truth. But listen, let me, let me tell you. The Lord Jesus walked on this earth. And being indwelt by the Holy Spirit means that the one that walked on this earth, the one that changed the water to wine, and the one that healed the blind, and the one that walked up to the grave of Lazarus and said, come out of that grave, and he came out of that grave, and the one that raised other people from the dead, and the one that fed the 5,000 with just a fish or two and a loaf of bread. The one that went to Gethsemane. The one that went to the cross and shed his blood. The one that uh, came out of that grave on the first Lord's Day morning. The one that ascended into glory. The one that is sitting at the right hand of the Father. And the one that is coming back again lives in our hearts. Somebody said he went away but he didn't go away. The Bible says Christ is with us. Emmanuel, Christ with us. Listen, he is gone, but he hasn't gone. He lives within our hearts. It is hard to fathom that that person lives, the one that performed all of those miracles, lives within our hearts. And let me tell you, he lives in your hearts and he wants to come to church every Sunday. Amen. Amen. He wants you to walk right. The person lives in your heart wants you to read the word of God and study and pray. The one that lives in your heart wants you to share him with others. He lives in you and he lives in me. Many people don't understand that wonderful truth. Well, there's another step.
Christ on us. Romans 13 and verse 14. Not only Christ for us and Christ in us, but Christ on us. Romans 13, 14 says, put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what's Paul talking about? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Putting on Christ means to be so clothed with him that when others see us, they see Christ. To put on Christ means to be more and more like him. Now you can have Christ in you and nobody will ever know it. And I think that's probably what one of the greatest sins of, of Christian people is that we have Christ in us, but nobody even knows it. In fact, many times, many Christians, many believers try to hide the fact that they are Christians. Listen, when you put on Christ, the world will know that you're a Christian. I have overcoated the house, but you don't know it because you haven't seen me have it on. But when you see me wearing that overcoat when it's cold, you will know that I have an overcoat. And that's the way it is with knowing Christ. Paul is saying, let the world know by clothing yourself with Christ. If you don't clothe yourself with Christ, the world will never know that you're a child of God. You can work in that office or in that shop or in that factory. You can work there day after day. If you're not wearing the Lord Jesus Christ, they'll never know that you're a child of God. But I'll tell you, clothe yourself. You put on the Lord Jesus Christ and every person in that place will know that you're a Christian. You don't have to work there but a day or two. If you're a Christian and you have on the Lord Jesus Christ, they won't have to ask you that you're a Christian. They'll know that you're a Christian. Listen, we have too many Christians who are ashamed to put on Christ. I heard about a man that had a, had a, had a dog, a new dog, very fine looking dog. And he went to his friend and his friend said to him, what a great dog you got. What a beautiful dog. And, and he said, by the way, what kind of dog is that? And he said, it's a police dog. And he said, well, he don't look like a police dog. He said, sure. He's in the secret service. Listen, <laughs> my, listen. <laughs> Too many Christian people are in the secret service. God has got plenty of secret servants. He doesn't need any more in the secret, in the secret service for him. He needs some people that will come out and put the uniform on and put, the, put on the Lord Jesus and wear the Lord Jesus so that people can know that we're children of God. When we're wrapped up in the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll only look at what we should look at, what he would look at. We'll only listen to what he would listen to. We'd only talk the way that he would talk. We'd only touch the things that he would touch. We would only eat and drink only what he would eat and drink. Think only what he would think. Go to the places where he would go if we have on the Lord Jesus. Listen, when you put on Christ, you'll not be concerned about fulfilling the desires of the flesh. As Paul tells us in Romans chapter 13 and 14, put on the Lord. Wear the Lord Jesus. Let other people know that you're a child of the King. Now, how do we enjoy Jesus right now? First of all, by remembering that Christ is for us on the cross. And then by knowing that Christ is in us and knowing that Christ is on us. But there's one last thing. The fullness of Christ will not be known in our life until we experience this. It won't be fulfilled until we do. Christ with us. Christ with us. You remember those beautiful words of John 14, 1 through 3, where Jesus was talking to his apostles and he said to them, they were troubled. Their hearts were breaking. Jesus was going away. They didn't understand it. They didn't know what was happening. They didn't know what God was doing. They'd been with him and talked with him and, and had fellowship with him. He, he had taught them. And, and when they had a problem, they went straight to him. But now he says, I'm going away. And their hearts were frightened. Their hearts were troubled. And he said, let not your hearts be frightened. Let not your hearts be troubled. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will. These are powerful words right here. We don't want to miss this. I will come 
back for you. That's the words of the Lord. He said, I will come again. Now Christ will be with us face to face when he comes for us. Now what will happen when Jesus Christ comes uh, for his saints? What's going to happen? Well, Paul lets us in on the secret in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through, through 18. Here's what he says. He outlines the whole thing. You see, the people at Thessalonica and that in that area there, they were very upset because they thought that Jesus was coming. In fact, they just laid down. They, they just said, well, the Lord's going to come here. No use us working. No use us uh, uh, serving him. We're just going to quit. So they quit. And the Lord didn't come. And they began to get worried. Say, what about, what about our loved ones? What about our friends that have gone on? And, and, G, and Paul said, let not your hearts be troubled as others are troubled. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Listen, he said, one day, one day, he said, I don't want you to be ignorant. God is going to come and he's going to put his foot out there on the cloud and he's going to call those in the grave out of that grave. This is going to be a great resurrection day when the Lord comes for us to be with him. Those bodies are going to come out of the grave and it's not going to be a, a different body. It's going to be the same body, a resurrected body. You see, they place that body out there in the cemetery out there in the ocean or out there somewhere and where there's no pieces can be found but God knows where every speck is and he'll bring that up and he'll change that body to a perfect body and soul and body will be joined together because you see those that are dead in Christ they are already with the Lord Paul said absent from the body is to be present with the Lord you can't kill the soul the soul never sleeps the soul goes on to be with the Lord with the Lord for the believer and the soul and body will be joined together and then the Bible says those of us that are on this earth will be caught up together with them in the clouds and the twinkling of an eye will be changed and we'll be with them and we'll also be face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ in glory. What a great reunion day that's going to be. What a day of rejoicing when we are together with our loved ones again and we see Jesus face to face and we can thank him for all the blessings and the joys that he's given us on this earth face to face with the Lord will be with him. Keep this in mind. The world may despise you. The world may reject you. The world may hate you. But there's coming a glorious reception awaiting you at the coming of the Lord. Rest assured that he's coming for us to be with us. Jesus said, I will come again. The messenger said, the same Jesus that ascended into heaven, he's going to come back right here. He's going to put his feet right on the Mount of Olives. He's coming back. And the Lord said, or Paul said, the Lord himself. Now what does the fullness of Christ mean? It means that Christ is for us on the cross. Christ is in us. Christ on us. And Christ with us. That's the fullness. Do you know the fullness of Christ? The fullness of Christ begins with a new birth experience. It begins by coming to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You have no hope outside of that. You're doomed. You're on the way to hell. You're on the way to receiving the judgment of God if you've not experienced the new birth. You're on the way to a final judgment that you don't want any part of. Listen, come to the Lord today. Let me share some verses with you. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 1. This is what Paul said to the church at Corinth. He said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherewith you stand, by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture, and that he was buried and that he arose again the third day according 
to the scripture. Notice that third verse. For I delivered unto you first of all how that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. Now what do you think is the most important word in that whole verses that I read? The most important word is that little three letter preposition that he died for my sins. If he just died, it wouldn't mean anything to me. If he just shed his blood on that cross, it wouldn't mean a thing to me because a lot of people have died on crosses and shed their blood but this one's different. He's the Son of God. God incarnate, walking among men, older than his daddy, as old as his daddy and older than his mother. Born without a biological father. He died for. Oh, I'm thankful for that. He died for my sins I couldn't sleep tonight if I didn't know for sure that I'm saved do you know for sure do you know for sure that you're saved let's stand up heads bowed and eyes closed some of you that are believers today You are drifters like a ship on the sea. You are drifters. You know when a ship has lost control or the captain lost control of the ship, it's subject to the elements of the sea, drives it. When you have lost the touch of God in your life and you have not put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're subject to all the elements out there and they're going to take you where they want you to go and you don't want to go there. As a Christian, come. Say, Lord, I want to put you on. I want to wear you. I want people to know that I'm a Christian. Those of you that are not saved, come and let me help you today. Let me help you. I'll be here in the altar to help you. I'll be right here. I want you to come. Don't put it off. Come to the Lord today. That every time you put it off, it'll be harder for you to be saved the next time. Because your heart will grow colder and harder and will be easier to reject the gospel. One in a thousand believers were saved past 30 years old. One in a thousand. If there's an inkling in your heart right now to come to the Lord, you come. Don't put it off. Come right now. Debbie's beginning to play. Come to the Lord.